OEL's uh, or the OSHA legislation uh, and the REACH uh, operate actually without prejudice from one, one another. Okay? That's kind of known, but it's not necessarily always said. But even if it's without prejudice, it does not mean that they could not complement each other. They should complement each other. And at least when we are looking at things, we don't see a reason why they would not. Okay. Uh, we've done in the past five years quite a lot, both in the Commission and, and in ECA, to improve the coherence of the OEL and REACH. Um, and, and this is something I'll talk about a bit more in detail. Uh, authorization requirements that I talked about earlier have actually facilitated the adoption of OELs. And I'll give you an ex one example in particular, which is hexa hexavalent chromium. I think it's a wonderful story. I can talk about that for half an hour if you want to. Uh, restrictions have also very often paved the way to the possible OELs, and we have 1.4 dichlorobenzene as an example. So if you put it in a nutshell, you have the harmless classification, uh, mainly, sometimes it's PBTs and EDs, but mainly harmless classification that drives both, both OSH and REACH. Okay? And then from OSH you get the occupational limits, or then, then on REACH you get the restrictions or, or authorization requirements. And they are doing sort of the same thing. I mean, at the end of the day, the whole thing boils down to companies doing something. The limit value per se doesn't do anything. It's only when you take measures uh, to, to reduce, increase ventilation, for instance, or whatever it is. And it's, it's the same driver at the end of the day, the shop floor, that is going, going to, to make the difference. The only question is, does it come under one or the other piece of legislation? So what REACH requires is adequate control of risks to workers from exposure of chemical substances or also mixtures, uh, which are placed on the market in the EU. There is no sort of fundamental control, uh, conflict between adequate control and the OSHA directives. Uh, we went through some of the guidance documents, and there are a couple of quotes over here uh, about that. So OSH uh, is a limit below which it is unlikely that a significant adverse health effect will occur. Okay? And derived no effect level is uh, not intended to replace the threshold of, uh, uh, above which a harm will occur, but rather a threshold below which no effect will occur. It's not the same concept, but there are similarities, obviously. OELs and DNLs coexist and in some circumstances may apply simultaneously to some work activities. Essentially, the working method is that, uh, and this is now resembles very much restrictions, by the way, modeled after that. So ECA Secretariat, which is now the kind of dossier submitter in the restriction terms, proposes an OEL, it makes a dossier, which is an OEL dossier. RAC, uh, the Risk Assessment Committee of ECA, evaluates and gives its opinion to the EU for decision. Again, very similar to, to authorization, sorry, for restrictions, except we don't have the socioeconomic analysis committee involved here, only RAC. Um, then we also prepare an annual report to the Commission, that's part of like the collaboration agreement. Um, we were asked then to do two dossiers in 2019, which is lead and its compounds, and the other one is in diisocyanates. And we just recently got a request to do cadmium and its inorganic in in compounds and asbestos. So we're starting to work on those. The OEL process is over here, uh, and, and uh, again, it resembles uh, the restriction process, but there are differences. The most important part is that when we prepare the dossier, ECA, we very often make a call for evidence, like we do, would do also for restrictions. Um, so the call for evidence is something where we would get the most relevant information about uh, the, the subject matter, and then, then hopefully, based on that, do the best possible um, dossier. And then the evaluation uh, is carried out uh, by the, uh, by the uh, Risk Assessment Committee, and there is a public uh, consultation about the report that is, is the scientific report that is pay, uh, given to the, the committee, uh, and that report is public. And again, like in restrictions, you, you, we will get comments on that, and then the committee takes those into account when they are formulating their opinion. Then the final uh, version of the opinion is then, then published as well, and it goes to the Commission, and then you know, sooner or later there will be an OEL that is published by the Commission. In summary, when it comes to the OELs, the Commission asks ECHA to prepare uh, the scientific under underpinning, and then there are two ways of doing it. If it's, if it's carcinogens or mutagens, the li li limit value will be binding at the EU level, and that 
is using a different uh, legislative procedure. It's something called nowadays ordinary legislative procedure. Uh, I don't know how ordinary it is, but it is uh, extraordinary because it, it requires both the Commission and the Council, meaning all member states and the Parliament, to agree. Uh, because it's actually a co-decision uh, in, the, in their language. Uh, that whereas if it's an indicative OEL, meaning it's not a carcinogen or a mutagen, then the Commission decides with a comitology procedure, which is similar to restrictions or similar to authorization. Uh, so it's consulting member states, but the Commission actually decides alone. Authorizations. Hex 11 chromium limit value in Europe was, I can't remember what it was exactly, but it was proposed to be 25. Okay. In the US it's 50 recommendation. Okay. Um, and then um, companies who applied for authorization, they were saying, uh oh. I mean, this is kind of the exposure levels we are having at the moment. This, this, data, this data is a bit old. I mean, it's maybe five, ten years old from France. So we, are, we, we either are at two or we will be at two. And that's what we want to do now. So two, 25, it's kind of far away, would you agree? And many of the companies were thinking, actually, we can be at one. Uh, in the meantime, France and Germany, if I recall correctly at least, have national legislation binding limit value of one. So scratching our heads a bit further, companies applying for authorization, putting hard-earned money, they say they can do two or one. National limit values of the main uh, industrial users in Europe over there, Switzerland is one, one as well, if, if I recall correctly. Um, and then we're talking about 25 over here. Um, so when the Commission's proposal went to the European Parliament, this information was kind of around, and they started scratching their heads as well. What's going on here? And uh, a bit longer sto long story short, after 2016, the adopted OEL was 10 micrograms per cubic meter, not 25 and the OEL in 2025 will be 5 micrograms per cubic meter. The point here is actually that, with that with, because of the authorization process, a lot of information is revealed, made public because we're transparent, known to everybody, and during the process of adopting the new OEL was used. More chemicals will be managed under risk management in the EU. That's sort of you've been hearing that. Uh, the question is how? Uh, OELs, the restrictions and authoriz uh, authorization are going to be developed, I believe, more coherently. Uh, and the limit values, whether it's OELs or, or DNLs, uh, and the measures to uh, that would be required or undertaken by industry will be mutually in reinforcing. I think we'll be having that coherence uh, better now when we have a better institutional setup still under each review or any other review of the legislation that can be further reinforced. But at least we have, have a good basis. Uh, the institutional progress that, that we've seen already, uh, I don't see any reason why it would not continue. Uh, we talked about that already uh, earlier here in, in terms of some other pieces of legislation as well. How do we knit them better, even better together than, than we have them at, at the moment? And again, uh, in the future, again, harmless classification, PBT and ED assessment uh, are going to provide also in the future the scientific underpinning. <laughs>